Hello and welcome back to the Evil Treehouse for another installment of my uh, video series on Pixie JS. For those of you who watched the first one, uh, I apologize for it not being the most exciting thing uh, you've probably seen on YouTube today. Um, it was just kind of a give us a baseline primer or a boilerplate on how one might go around creating a Pixie JS project. Uh, for the first half dozen of these, I kind of thought I would go very uh, very prototypical and just kind of get out as much as get as much functionality up as soon as possible so uh, there's definitely a ways one can do things better or maybe more efficiently uh, but I would probably consider covering that in the future but for now for those of you who are still just new to the Pixie JS concept in general uh, let's continue with another uh, we'll call it a 101 course with Pixie. Uh, the last time we did how to set up a, a, your rendering area, uh, how to draw text to it, basically the general concept of how a assets work in Pixie. So today I figured we move on to something that's a bit more fundamental to all game design for the JavaScript world and indeed all 2D games in general, which are sprites. Uh, sprites are probably going to be the baseline entity for anyone doing any real game development in Pixie.js. A sprite is essentially an image, uh, an image you can move around, manipulate, interact with, so it basically represents anything and everything within a game. So for the prototype here, I'm basically going to put together um, a generic asset that we're going to render on the screen and maybe make it move. Um, I have a a standard asset I use for doing my prototype prototype work because I'm not an artist. That's just a, a, a small single frame zombie from uh, an open source 2D game. So I figure we'll use that very same one for our demonstration here. So to start, I got my uh, my HTTP server running. I have my boilerplate essentially the code we uh, built on the last one set up here so all we have defined so far is basically the boilerplate that I wrote originally with a few callouts to uh, what we need to work on to actually accomplish what we're trying to do here so for our setup we just have it building the uh, render throwing it on the on the page and running the render loop which currently doesn't do anything um, we have a few basic uh, constant variables to find here. Uh, the, the, the size of the zombie sprite is 32 pixels by 32 pixels. Nice little square. Um, we're gonna render 100 of them on the screen and then we're gonna have them kind of run away in, in, a, in a random sense. And, and then once they go off screen they effectively die. And the game will continue, to, oh, the game, the prototype will run until uh, there's no more zombies left on the screen at which time it will stop. So to get us underway here, let's go ahead and uh, we'll probably want to bring in our uh, zombie image. Um, it's over here in an assets folder called zombie PNG. So once we have uh, our render set up, our root stage set up, let's go ahead and uh, create our texture. Uh, everything in Pixie revolving around sprites comes from a texture. Uh, the, the sprite is essentially the representation of a texture on the, on the canvas whereas the texture itself is the actual root image so you load the texture once and then you can have many copies of it on the screen at any given time so I'll set up a variable to, to keep track of it call it TX zombie um, down here in our setup we'll go ahead and load it um, Pixie provides a really cool set of loader helpers for doing games which might have dozens or even hundreds of textures. Uh, since this is a single one we'll just go ahead and do this uh, from image helper method which is just a quick way to get it. Uh, it will load it automatically for us and set it up accordingly. So once we have it created we'll define the render area. So this is what how you uh, define which part of the physical image you want to actually use for rendering so you can cut out a section of it 
to actually represent your texture. This is pretty common for doing things like uh, sprite sheets where you'd have 10 rows and 12 columns of, of different frames of animation. When we get into that, I'll definitely demonstrate some of that. But for here, we're just going to say that the top left corner is 0, 0, and the bottom right corner is the size of the image. So the whole image is going to represent the frame in this case. So now we have our, our zombie texture loaded and our zombie texture defined. So, to give us a backdrop, I'm going to do just some really basic uh, vector graphic art. Not very exciting, but I'm going to create basically a street. Um, it's just going to give us something more interesting to look at than just a generic background. So we're going to define a new vector graphic object. We're going to fill it. We're going to set it to fill black, and we're just going to draw a rectangle on the screen. Got 200 pixels down from the top, and we'll make it go from edge to edge, and we'll make it 48 pixels wide. So that's that. And now, just to make the street look a little more interesting, instead of just a black bar across. Why don't we go ahead and add some lines, some <laughs> traffic lines. So we'll go ahead and do, uh, basically uh, we'll have it keep drawing until it runs off the screen. And do a couple hundred pixel wide lines here. So we'll go ahead and create a new vector graphic. Sorry for my typing. I have acquired a keyboard in case some of you uh, didn't notice. Uh, so hopefully the keyboard and sounds aren't as annoying as they once were. Uh, yeah, so make it 50 pixels wide, or long, and 10 pixels wide. So. Okay, now we have our street built, our lines built, and now we will go ahead and add them to our scene. First, since everything's drawn in order that's added, we'll add the street first. And then as we build each line, we'll add each line as well. So I think that's enough to at least get us started. Let's go ahead and take a look. Make sure our render thing is still running. Go ahead and go to my Right here. Pretty exciting. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong project. Oh, my mistake. <laughs> Please excuse me one second. I'm kind of got ahead of ourselves there. So let me go ahead and launch the one I meant to launch okay that's more along the lines of what I was expecting to see sort of we need to uh, make our lines appear what's a good yellow let's do like C3 C B 0 0 there we go it's a street how exciting It'll get more exciting, I promise. Uh, for the fun part, we've already seen vector graphics before. Who cares, right? So uh, let's actually put some damn zombies on the screen. So we're going to do our initializer loop. We're just going to go ahead and go through 0 through 99, since we're maxing out 100. We will create a new sprite. First time I can type right. New pixie sprite, and we pass it the texture we want to use. So as we defined above, we have our single cell, which you saw on the graphic that I was mistakenly showing, and not very fancy looking, but it'll do the job. Um, so we have our sprite set up. It's built, the texture's assigned. Uh, for the first thing I like to do is to set its anchor point. Uh, this is optional depending on how your mind process works, but essentially it's the point 
which counts as the origin for the for the sprite. So typically it starts at the top corner. So if you move the zombie to 10, 10, you're actually moving the top left corner to 10, 10. So what I'm doing here is I'm actually setting the anchor in the center of the sprite. So when I say move zombie to 10, 10, it's going to center over that point. So for some of your logic for doing things like collision detection, I think having the anchor in the center helps a lot. So that's what I like to do. Um, as far as where we're going to position him on the screen, uh, we'll just do something random. Why not? This is a demo. So we'll do a zombie position set. We'll put it basically anywhere on the screen. So what we're going to do here is we're going to multiply our definition of our canvas by random, which those of you know will give you a random value between zero or between, not including zero and one. So this would basically put it anywhere on the screen at random. So we have our zombies built, we have our zombies positioned, now we just need to add them to the scene. Ta-da! Okay. So now we refresh here. We have 100 zombies randomly positioned on the screen. Kind of not very exciting yet, so let's take it a step further here. Um, as you might have seen in my update loop, I kind of want them to run around like crazy and die when they disappear off the screen. So to facilitate that, we're going to give the zombie a direction that's random. So we're going to look at its value for x and y. It's going to go between negative 1 and 1. So every time this, the loop updates, it's going to move the zombie that number of pixels um, between negative one and one on either axis. So zombies should theoretically be running in all directions. Uh, we have a defined speed here. Uh, maximum speed would be five pixels per frame. So we'll go ahead and define that here. We'll just call it move speed. And again, since we're not, not to make them all run in unison, we'll do another random time speed with a minimum of one so that way we don't wait here for hours while they're running. Um, we have a zombies array here that I set up. Uh, this will help us for doing our updating. So even though we've added to the frame, we're going to go ahead and add it to our private array so we can reference it later. So to accomplish that, we're going to need to actually start doing something in our render loop. Um, it'll run as long as the number of zombies is greater than zero. So when we start out, it's going to be 100. And until that number goes down, it's going to run forever. So uh, here, let me make the screen a bit more accessible here. OK. So now we're going to do a for loop. We use our for each function here. <laughs> In honor of Shaun of the Dead, we'll call it Z. Not using the Z word. Anyway. <laughs> um, just as a catch to keep it from freaking out if we get a, a zombie that doesn't exist anymore. So, here we go. For every zombie in every loop, we're going to add, you remember this to be a negative or positive value, its direction multiplied by its speed. We'll do the same thing on the y-axis. Okay, so now we have zombies running all directions. Their positions are being moved. So now we basically just need to look, did I go off screen? So we'll look at the positions of their x and check, is it less than negative 3, 2, meaning it has completely run off the side, or has run off the top or position x resolution width has it run off the right side of the screen or resolution height 
right plus dx on the side. Does it run off the bottom? Now these pixel measurements with the zombie size being taken into question are probably not pixel exact. Odds are, if I do the math right, the pixels, the zombies may live a little longer than you would expect them to, but it should resolve itself within one or two frames, so we, as human beings, won't even notice. So if any of those conditions are true, we're going to do a remove child, which takes an entity off, uh, out of a container, so it essentially disappear from the scene. Um, it is always important when you're planning on getting rid of something to call destroy. This will make sure your RAM is freed up uh, for Pixie so that you don't end up with a memory leak situation where you do this over and over and again, your app gets slower and slower and slower until you run out of RAM. So we take it away from the scene, we destroy it in the background, and we go ahead and set the, uh, the call back to zero or the, the, we're setting the frame back to blank. And pursuant to that, we're gonna take some zombies down by one. And this final evaluator will return true if there's still zombies left on the screen, or false if there's none, and then at which time the render loop will stop. Uh, you can see here if update returns false, it's just gonna abort the render loop. So, Fingers crossed. We have zombies running with reckless abandon. Um, again, some of them are running a little slower, so the loot may run a little longer than you want to, but you get the idea. You have, in what, 100 lines of code, we built out all the elements of that. That's pretty good. Um, so that's sprites. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with them. Uh, the documentation on Pixie.js really helps you do f anything you could think of, like rotating and scaling. Uh, again, you just call simple functions like zombie.scale.set or rotation. Uh, oh, here's a fun one. Let's just go ahead and do something. Uh, this one is something I use a lot, which is uh, tinting. Uh, it's hardware accelerated, so you can draw your zombie once and you can add tints to it to make it change color dynamically. So this is like a, I think that's a red or a purple or a green. I think it's a green, like a darkish green. So we'll define a generic color there. And then down here when we build out our uh, zombie elements, we'll go ahead and add a tint. And we can do random colors, we can do anything we can think of. So if we just do that green and right again, you'll see they all have a, a nasty green color to them. Uh, just by adding two lines of code. Uh, so that's a primer on sprites. Um, hopefully some of you found this at least somewhat re-engaging. I apologize for the big gap. Uh, my day job requires me to do a lot of potential travel in the summer. So I was uh, called away elsewhere but hopefully I plan to get back to this. I saw about 50-ish people saw the first one and didn't totally hate it. At least if they did, they didn't tell me, so thank you for those of you. Um, hopefully this one at least gets you a little bit more interested. And for our next one, I think we're gonna start doing, like, uh, start moving in the direction of a game, uh, actually interactive. Uh, for now, we've just done prototypes. So the next one is gonna be uh, building out a control scheme. So look forward to that one. Uh, I guess I'll see you all later. So thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you next time. See you later.